Hey, this is Blanca Gamer. welcome to another Kickback Review. Here we have Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night, a game kickstarted by Kogi Igarashi of Castlevania fame. Best known for his work in Symphony of the Night and the subsequent Castlevania games in that style similar to Metroid, or Igavanias as they were often called. After leaving Konami because of, well, Konami, and struggling to find support on his own, Iga pitched a Kickstarter for a new spiritual successor game in 2015. Needless to say, that Kickstarter did quite well, raising over $5.5 million. And as a Castlevania fan, I naturally backed it and even went for the $60 physical copy tier when my cheap ass usually just sells for a digital version. It was worth getting as not only did I get a copy with a nice backer sleeve, but also access to the E3 and beta demos and a few other goodies too. Oh, and Curse of the Moon that came out last year too, which was a nice stretch goal inclusion. Definitely check out that one as well if you haven't already. The game released in June of this year for PC, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. This will just be on the PlayStation 4 version as that was what I chose to get. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night should be very familiar to anyone who has played Symphony of the Night or any Metroidvania game really. And while this game is not subtle in the slightest with its nods to Iga's previous works, which is to be expected, the game does have its own identity. The world of Bloodstained takes place during the Industrial Revolution of England, where an alchemy guild used the powers of demon-infused crystal shards to make people who harness them called Shardbinders, whom they used to prove the guild's importance to their wealthy investors. But in sacrificing the Shardbinders to summon demons to make a further point, the alchemists kind of bit off more they can chew and threw the world into chaos. Whoops. Only two Shardbinders survived this sacrificial purge, a man named Jebel and Miriam, who is the game's protagonist and was put into a deep sleep beforehand. Ten years later, she awakens and discovers that Jeebel has recently been doing demon summoning, so she goes off along with former Alchemist Guild member Johannes to put a stop to it. Structurally, the narrative still plays out like an Egovania, right down to the character interactions that set points during progression. So it is obvious that it's a not Castlevania game, but one that does have an interesting gothic premise and characters centered around it. It's a good balance of original and inspired ideas, I feel. And that feeling goes towards the gameplay itself, which, like I said earlier, is pretty much a brand new Igavina game, just without the Castlevania. Ritual of the Night is an explorative platformer where Miriam fights all sorts of demons along the way. The simplest way to dispatch them is with a large assortment of weapons you can find to equip, ranging from different types of swords, spears, whips, boots, and even guns, the last of which being able to use consumable ammo types that are more powerful than the default infinite shots. As for Miriam's magical abilities, they are from absorbing shards that occasionally come from slain demons. These work pretty much like the souls in the Castlevania Sword games, in that you select what ones to use that have various attacks and effects from associated demons. There's red shards for single button attacks, blue shards for holding button abilities, yellow for passive buffs, purple ones where you aim and fire with the right stick and R2 button, being a nice way to utilize all the controls for a game like this, green shards for summons that help out Miriam, and white shards that are usually ability upgrades. There are a lot of shards you can collect, and half the fun is getting new ones and seeing what they do, encouraging experimentation or you can just stick with what you like, it's your choice really. Fortunately, there is a shop to buy supplies, an alchemy system where you can upgrade your shards and make just about everything so long as you have the materials and recipes for them. Not to mention being able to break down items from materials, by using an item specifically for that mind you, and whatever you make does get stuck in the store, so it is a flexible and not too complicated crafting system. Oh, and you can make food too, with alchemy. These are not only good recovery items, but eating a new food item for the first time will give you a permanent stat increase, giving you a good reason to try and make all of the food recipes. Of course, with this much item management, you'll be spending a lot of time in menus, but sorting in favorite options and being able to assign and equip shards to shortcuts do help reduce that. And really, the game does a great job in moving you along, giving you new abilities to progress to other parts of the map at a good pace. There is the usual amount of backtracking because of this, but with designated warp points, it's never too tedious to travel to where you need to go. Of course, even someone like me that's played a fair amount of Metroidvanias can still get stumped as to where to go now and then, even when the game gives you a decent amount of hints as to where to go next. It's more so my own moments of brain farting rather than the game's fault. Still, there are plenty of things to do even when just wandering around. There's side quests to kill a certain number of enemies to avenge some not subtle names of slain villagers or get specific items to. You can find bookcases that either have journals or move commands for certain weapons. The latter of which you can perform and eventually master most of them so that move can be used with all of the weapons of that type. They can be a little fickle to use, especially in the frantic nature of combat, but are satisfying to pull off and give some depth to the weapons system. The rest of the controls are perfectly fine, as Miriam controls like a dream with fluid response of jumping, attacking, and a backstep that's more useful at an invasion move than you would think. There's also a surprising amount of customization you can do with Miriam and how she looks, even being able to find new hairstyles for her to have. 
The one aspect of this that's a little obstructive is that some equipment and accessories will appear on Miriam 2, which is amusing, especially during conversations, until you realize you've been keeping on particular pieces because it currently has the best preferred stats. So you may just stick with whatever is on her face for optimization until you get something better. Appearances be damned. It does undermine that costume aspect a little, but it's a minor cosmetic gripe. The rest of the visual design I'd say is quite good. While the 3D visuals may not completely appeal to those that prefer sprite-based ones, it does hold up pretty well, making good use of the environments with a range of location themes that stand out from each other. The art direction is solid too, utilizing the Unreal 4 engine to pull everything off, even if the development took longer and needed additional studios to assist, but took that extra time to improve the visuals from the feedback of the demos, so that worked out in the long run. The PlayStation 4 version, on a regular level system at least, does run smooth most of the time. The frame rate does dip down a little in some of the larger areas, and a few boss fights did have some lag when things got hectic. But overall, the performance wasn't too bad despite a few hiccups here and there. Which I can't say with the Switch version from what I've heard, but the developers are working on improving it with a series of patches. What does not need improving is the music. The soundtrack was primarily composed by Castlevania Square veteran Michiru Yamani, and it's up to her standards of quality. Having Machiru do the music for this game really helps solidify this as the next Egovania as they are great pieces that fit in wherever you go. The voice work is also good, though a tad quiet on the default sound settings. Even then, their performances are fine and there's a couple nice stretchable inclusions like David Hayter as Zengetsu and even Robert Belgrade, the original voice for Alucard in Symphony of the Night, as a character that was a nice surprise. Normally I wouldn't spoil that, but I can't help fanboying over something like that and the game has been out for over two months now anyway. I can safely say, without spoiling anything else, that Ritual of the Night met my expectations as an Egovania successor and was worth backing for. I even fully completed the game, Platinum Trophy and all. And there is more content coming, eventually as it will be periodically released later on. Until then, the only added inclusion was the Ega Backer DLC, which while initially a $60 tier and up exclusive, the publisher did make it available publicly for about $10, which is pretty steep for what is basically a bonus boss fight and its rewards. Still, I look forward to the rest of the content, and that Ritual of the Night proves that Spirit Successor games being Kickstarter can meet expectations if done right. That's about all I have to say on Bloodstained for now, so I'll see you all in the next video.